And it is a pleasure, as always, to welcome uh, back to the program Matt Taibbi of Rolling Stone Magazine. Welcome, uh, Matt. How's it going, Sam? It's going well. How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, excellent. I didn't Happy wake to you. be back on your show. I didn't wake you, did I? No, almost. All right, yeah, I understand. But, uh... I know how you guys, Rolling Stone <laughs> Magazine, we know what happens over there. Right, right, We right, all get there. Yeah. We all... Uh, so, hey, all right. So, there's a couple of things I wanted to uh, talk to you about. Let's let's start with um, this uh, audit the Fed bill uh, that passed the House. Uh, we both know that it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, the Senate's not going to pass it. But let's just for a moment, and, and and we should say that it it passed with uh, almost entirely Republican support. I think there was one Republican who. Uh, joined about half of the Democratic caucus in voting against it. Um, mm-hmm. let, let's just talk about the value of of this. We, there was a one-time Fed audit in the past, yes? Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, yep. do, uh, the, inspired by, by Ron Paul and, and Bernie Sanders. And um, I think Alan Grayson in the House, too, was right, a big Grayson, part of yeah. that. And that was yep. part of uh, Dodd-Frank. It was a one-time uh, audit, which was, as far as I can tell, not problematic, not earth-shattering in terms of, you know, uh, destabilizing our, uh, our, our monetary system. Uh, and it was, was helpful to get a sense of what they did during the, the bailouts. Yeah, the... the uh... The amazing thing about that that thing was that even though there were some pretty incredible revelations out of that audit, um, it proved not to be all that harmful to the Fed because uh, the media basically didn't pay any attention to it. So even though there were some incredible things, like you know the fact that the Fed had had uh, given out sixteen trillion dollars in emergency lending uh, since two thousand and eight and had been giving you know loans to everybody from the banks in the middle east to the you know the wives of CEOs of of big wall street banks um it, it just it didn't really leave a, a stain on the on the fed because nobody really covered it get that last one i had not even heard until uh reading about uh you know sort of stories around this uh <clears throat> this bill Wait, tell us that uh, I had never heard this. The, the Fed gave loans to wives of owners of banks to go out and shop? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, not, not to go out and shop, um, but uh, they, they were, it was, I actually wrote the story, and I can't even remember. It was, it was, the, it was the wife of, um, uh, the wives of a couple of Morgan Stanley executives, and what they, they had a hedge fund uh who and they they qualified for a program called TALF um <laughs> interestingly in, in in Washington when this the story started circulating uh the they were nicknamed the TALF milfs mm. uh <laughs> and uh um but they these two women got uh, 220 million dollar uh loan from the Fed um essentially to act as middlemen for uh, consumer lending. It, a lot of this is complicated, but what the Fed really was doing with a lot of these bailout programs is it was giving free money to banks and asking them to stimulate the economy by provide to, by using that money to, um, you know, provide auto loans or student loans. Uh, so people like this would get the money at zero, and then they'd lend it out to us for a car loan at you know six or whatever, and so they'd make free money. And so uh, some of the people who were on this list were uh, extraordinary, uh, not not just these, these housewives, but uh, if you might remember the name Kenneth Dahlberg, does that name ring a bell to you yeah. at all? He was uh, he was the guy who uh, whose check ended up in the account of the Watergate burglars. Uh, he was the char- a character in uh, All the President's Men. He got a loan through this program. So almost everybody got it. There were, there were so many people who, uh, who, who, who got loans. But, again, it didn't really make a dent on, in the Fed uh, after all this came out. And, 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 of course, the theory was, and this has been sort of, I mean, this is almost sort of the, the paradigm the, that, uh, the, that we've seen since the beginning of this crisis. Give free money to the banks uh, mm-hmm. So that they can loan it out and make money off it, 
And uh, the problem with that is, is that when you have an economy that is uh, in the ditch, essentially, there's mm. people, people don't want to go out and take out loans to buy crap because, right. uh, because they're worried about the debt that they're already carrying, and they don't, they're, not, they're afraid that they're not going to be able to pay it off later. So what happens is the banks turn around and they say, well, uh, you know, we can try and uh, loan people for uh, cars or for houses or whatnot, but uh, if the demand's not there, and why take the risk when we can just turn around with this free money, buy treasury bills, essentially, right. and yeah. uh, know that the, the treasury is going to pay it off, and then we make our, you know, I guess, 3% at the time or whatever it was. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's one thing. Or they massively le- leverage up the money, you know, 100 or 200 times. Uh, and they make gigantic leveraged bets on derivatives, which can lead to these catastrophic losses. And I think that's what you saw with the J.P. Morgan Chase thing. So either either outcome is bad. It's not what's intended. I mean, what's intended is that they're supposed to stimulate the economy, uh, and you get sort of just the opposite of that. And so, you know, I mean, that that's the thing that people, I think, you know, we need to make clear for, for people is that the uh, the agenda theoretically was not to just enrich in the banks. It was, we're going to help the economy and the banks will, um, you know, we're, we are going to be incentivized in some way to help the economy rather than, for instance, in the original TARP, just going and um, uh, paying money uh, or, or, you know, loaning money at 0% interest. And if you're going to do it for the banks, why not do it for homeowners? And they right. pay off the banks that way uh, and, and make sure that money goes to the use that ostensibly, right, uh, the Fed wants it to go towards, uh, deleveraging people in some way. And right, yeah, no, yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the Wall Street's answer to that would be, well, the, the government could never administer all these loans. You know, we, they, they need to contract out with us to find all these people to lend to, so we should get a cut. And that, that does make some kind of sense, but the problem is we didn't, we didn't impose any conditions at all when we did these right. programs. We didn't say, uh, here's a bunch of money for student loans, but, you know, you can only charge X. Um, and so, right. you know, we gave the money for nothing, and they charge, you know, full market rates, and, and so, you know, that's, that's the problem. I, I think, you know, I haven't read the book yet, but I think there's a lot of, um, uh, in Borofsky's book, uh, a, a lot of that comes out where there's sort of, there seems to be, I, I don't know if some type of naivete or just sort of like, eh, you know, we're just not, in the, we don't want to in any way impinge upon bankers, uh, you know, uh, rights, you know, freedoms with our money right. uh, in some right. way. Right. Uh, because that would be, you know, anti-American. Uh, exactly. To, to infringe exactly. upon their... I mean, what do you think, like, you know, one of the things that I've seen, and, and let me ask you this, in terms of helping the economy, mm-hmm. um, people disagree as to whether or not the Fed actually has any more ability to, to help the economy. Um, the... The, the arguments that they, they do have the ability uh, center around doing, as far as I can tell, two big things. One is setting a higher inflation target. And two is, instead of, you know, you're giving these, uh, you're, you know, you're talking about opening up the uh, discount window again for banks. Why not open it up for cities and states uh, who need to borrow money and need to, uh, you know, and you, when, you, when you lend that money to the states, you know they're going to spend it on stuff that's going to stimulate the economy in some fashion uh, because they don't have the ability to go in and buy derivatives. Or right, yeah, they're not exactly. Gonna, uh, it's just the business that they're in. Uh, give me your sense of that. What, what's your take on, on, on what the Fed theoretically could do if you think they could do anything at this point? Well, some of this is a little bit above my pay grade. I mean, I think I was actually at a dinner last night with a with a whole bunch of Wall Street uh, economists who were kind of heatedly discussing this very topic of what is the Fed's role. And, you know, the, the general consensus is that we're in a situation right now where there's really only two, where there's so much debt um, that is being held by all the major industrialized countries uh, that there is really only there's only two outcomes uh, that that could possibly solve the pro- the debt problem. One is default, and the other one is uh, inflation. 
And in the meantime, the way that we're sort of moving the problem into the future and not having to deal with it right now is by sort of endlessly creating money uh, through central banking mechanisms like the Fed and just sort of pumping it into the financial bloodstream to to continually stave off the debt problem. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a debate to be had over whether that's appropriate or, I mean, again, I think this is a little bit above my, my, uh, my, my pay grade. You know, what, what happens if the, if the Fed suddenly stops, uh, you know, pumping money into the economy and, and we all have a, have a default? Is that a good outcome? Uh, but is it, a, is it a good outcome for them to continue to do this as well? Because that, that's eventually going to lead to this inflationary mess. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But clear, clearly, the one thing that is obvious is that it's all being held together by cheap money from the Fed and, by, and from central banks. Now, when they because say without that, when you say debt in this context, you're talking about private debt. Private and public debt. I mean, b- b- both things. I mean, I, if you if you look at uh, well, especially private debt. I mean, if you if you look at the 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 biggest banks in America, the depository, the big too big to fail banks, um, they probably have the just the American ones. They probably have three hundred and fifty or four hundred trillion dollars of risk uh, wrapped up in derivatives, and that's backed up by uh, you know only about seven or eight trillion dollars in deposits. So um, the real backing for all of that is is this the central bank. I mean, it's, it's the, the the idea implicitly that if any of those banks collapses, that they'll be bailed out by the Fed is, is sort of what keeps everybody from panicking and running for the exits. But I guess this is what, from what from what my understanding of the issue. But uh, clearly, you know, we had quantitative easing one, we had quantitative easing two. Uh, everybody expects that there's going to be quantitative and another another round of QE. Uh, coming maybe this fall or this winter, um, and this that is what's patching the the hole and 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 preventing uh, the debt problem from becoming overwhelming. Mm. And um, the the uh, uh, the I, I you know the I think the the notion I mean the the thing that I don't know the thing that strikes me is just sort of this notion that somehow the the Fed will just stop you know I mean it's like the the uh, as if it's sort of the the Fed doesn't uh, is is sort of I guess uh, blind to certain uh, things that are happening in the economy. I mean, I think I don't know. I I I, I certainly believe that we could uh, do for some inflation, and there's no reason I can see why the Fed wouldn't uh, loan to cities and states at this point. Uh, because you know what, if you're if you're going to do it to the banks, uh, why not? Right. Yeah. No. I I complete I completely agree. If we're if we're going to do this, if we're going to just en- endlessly create money and and you know uh, put it out into the economy, I I don't see any any reason why we have to have Wall Street as a middleman taking the bulk of it uh, as a cut for, and turn and turning it into profit, which is the most wasteful way to to deal with that money. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, just look at the way we uh, handle um, uh, our own sovereign debt. You know, we we lend money to banks at zero, and then they go uh, turn around and buy T-bills at 3% or whatever, and that's we're just giving money to banks when we could just be lending straight from the Fed to the federal government, I suppose. But right. uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You're right. And uh, and when we talk about those leverage, uh, when that type of leverage, this ag- again was uh, one of the um, uh, sort of the, I guess one of the things that people were really crying for was just there's a way to sort of control uh, these too big to fail banks from uh, leveraging um, uh, from leveraging their the the capital they have at uh, whatever thirty to one ratios, and that is to say right. you can only do it twelve to one, and and the right. the amazing thing is. Uh, Sandy uh, Whale, yeah, I guess it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Whale, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, comes out yesterday, or was it two days ago, and says, "Yeah, that's what we should do. <laughs> we should do." Uh, I know. And, and I know. I, I thought I was having an acid flashback when I saw that. I, I, I really did. When, I, when you know, Sandy Whale, he, he basically created too big to fail uh, by you know create, creating the, uh, the the Citigroup merger back in the nineties. 
which if, if people don't remember, he, he actually did this before it was legal. Uh, they, they did the city merger uh, before Glass-Steagall had been repealed. Um, <laughs> the Glass-Steagall prevented the merger of insurance companies, investment banks, and commercial banks. Uh, and they went ahead and they, they took Citigroup and Travelers and Solomon Smith Barney and merged them anyway, uh, and then got uh, an act of Congress to, to ratify it sort of uh, you know, retroactively. Um, and now he's turning around and saying it's bad for America and we should break up the, the too big to fail back. What did, what did people at your, uh, your dinner last night have to say about that? I mean, did people are just saying, oh, ah, yeah, he's people an old were coot. Just... Uh, no one's listened to him anymore. I mean, what, what, what did they say? Oh, we have, you know, people were rolling with laughter over the whole thing. In fact, I, I actually, a couple of people were pulling out their iPhones and just queuing it up and watching it over and over again for, com- <laughs> for comic value. Because the funniest thing about that clip, if you watch it, he's being interviewed by CNBC, and he's saying this whole thing about how we have to break up the too big to fail banks, it's bad for everybody, and, and the, you know, even on CNBC, the interviewer is, is, is like, oh, really? Don't, you know, didn't, didn't you create too big to fail? And, and he's totally surprised by that question, like he hadn't even anticipated it. Uh, and he, he basically says that um, he didn't have any responsibility for that, that uh, the, the barriers between commercial banking and investment banking have been broken long before uh, he did that merger, and so it wasn't his problem. And, and so that, 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 that's the, the funnier part of the, of the Right, that he's so deluded. I mean, he, I think, uh, I read somewhere that in his memoir he said it should be the, um, what was it, the, the Graham Leach? Was that, was that what, uh, the Graham, yeah, Graham Leach? Graham Leach, Graham Leach, Leach well, yeah, well, yeah. and, um, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I've talked to people who say that uh, Glass-Steagall was sort of the last linchpin of of that and that it had been slowly compromised over the years right. before then but um I, I that that's pretty it's pretty stunning just sort of how divorced uh from that reality i, I there was a, a comic in boston 20 years ago who had a joke to the effect of like uh he was telling some story about the rolling stones where um uh Keith Richards, you know, had to tell some of his uh, Rolling Stone buddies to uh, calm down, and and the punchline was, when Keith Richards tells you to to back off, you know you got a problem, and, <laughs> yeah, and that's the exactly. only thing I could think of when I saw that uh, th- that that he had come out and said that. I mean, and 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 he's right. We we do have a tremendous problem. But um, let's. I, I want to talk about because I, I saw that you um, you wrote about uh, octopus, and um, mm-hmm. I'm a, a, a friend of Guy's, and he'd been telling me the story that he was writing. Uh, Guy was on the program a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Fridays mm-hmm. ago, uh, talking mm-hmm. about the book. And actually, while I was interviewing him, Sam Israel emailed him, having seen him <laughs> on uh, on CBS that morning from prison, and it was like, dude, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you started off. It was funny because you started your your uh, your post about it, saying that Octopus is going to be made into a movie, and that was the first thing I said to Gee. I said, like, how can I insert myself between you and Hollywood right now, uh, right, so that yeah, I can exactly. make a killing off of this? Uh, because this thing is, uh, it really is an amazing story, and uh, it's funny because I think. There are basically two parts to this to this book, maybe one third, two thirds. One third mm-hmm. is sort of teeing up Sam Israel as he sort of learns about Wall Street, and then the maybe the second half of the book is how he gets sort of enmeshed in this incredible. I, I don't know if if it was all a con or the con man was being conned himself, and it was like uh, thrice over, um, and. You really, I, I, I love that uh, the the part about the con, just because I uh, spent so much time responding to uh, Nigerian four one nine, you know, uh, email scams. Um, right, and, right. And that's what this whole thing was in just some type of massive scale. But exactly, uh, you had a great point about the first part of the book. Talk about that because. Uh, y- you hit you, you hit the nail on the head as to why Sam Israel fell for this greater con. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the story is really it's like a three act play, right? Because he 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 works on Wall Street and he learns how it all works. Then he decides that he wants to become big time himself, and he kind of almost accidentally becomes Bernie ba- Ma- Bernie Madoff because he he starts a hedge fund and he experiences huge losses and he decides to lie about them, and that 
that leads to him sort of creating a Ponzi scheme where he's continually inventing returns uh, that don't really exist, and that attracts more customers. And before you know it, he's got a $400 million hedge fund, but he's like incredibly underwater, and it's all going to blow up eventually. Uh, but then the last part of it is he's got the – so he's one of the biggest con men on Wall Street uh, and most successful, but then he himself gets sucked into this – world where a bunch of conspiracy theorists convince him that there's this secret uh, bond market for the, you know, the Rothschilds and the Bilderbergs or whoever, uh, who are, you know, trading at, at, you know, 50% coupon bonds or something like that, where they, they're making basically free money hand over fist. And but they also, the with that, with those profits, they also very scrupulously divert like a certain percentage of those profits to uh, like end world hunger and end, right, end, yeah, end, end cure charity. AIDS and stuff. Yes. Yeah, I know it's insane. It's it's crazy, and and but the but what's so hilarious about it is is the reason that that Israel falls for this is because he grew up on Wall Street and he saw that basically. All of Wall Street is one giant insider trading and front running factory. Uh, um, every he was working for was was gaming the system in one way or another. Uh, and and I think that the, the thing that really turned his psyche was when he when the crash in '87 happened and Wall Street should have been wiped out, and instead the Fed jumped in and basically backstopped uh, all of Wall Street and allowed everybody to kind of borrow their way out of their problems and he he in his mind what he what he what he created was this a situation where uh you have a whole group of criminals on the one hand who are just routinely on a day-to-day basis stealing through insider trading and it's all enabled by the federal government and so why why wouldn't there be a secret cabal of conspirators who are you know Dealing in a secret bond market, and that—that's that, what's so fascinating. Is he—he he wouldn't have believed in this story if it hadn't. If he hadn't seen a lot of evidence <laughs> that that made it plausible, you know. And that's what's—I that, I love that part of it. That yeah, that part is is, is just uh, stunning. And and then sort of the, the there's a there's another sort of concurrent. Um, it's not quite a scam, but it really does speak to, and, and I was reading that book at the same time I was reading uh, Hayes' book on the Twilight of the Elites, which is talking about mm-hmm. how the elites uh, are corrupting themselves. <laughs> and while you've got this going on, there's a sort of a third player in this, which is John Ellis, George Bush's cousin, who right, has got yeah. his own VC uh, uh, company, and he's looking, or he's, these startups, and he's... He's basically leached on to Sam Israel, who is living in a Donald Trump house, like a $25,000 a month house. And he's leached on to this guy because uh, Israel is like a huge teat, uh, sort of feeding money into his VC thing. And he actually carries messages from Sam Israel, more or less, to the White House. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Because I he's know. so it's... beholden to that guy's money, he doesn't want to say at one point, like, you're completely back crap crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, it is, uh, it's just a, such a scary sort of view into what is actually going on uh, in these corners. And I don't know that it was really that much of an anomaly. No, but the, again, the, yeah, that, that's what's so amazing about the whole thing is that. Everywhere he looked, he just saw people acting in a predatory manner, and he saw that anybody who had any kind of information was trading against it instantaneously. And when he saw the behavior of the too big to fail banks, you know, in the crisis, uh, you know, in the crisis years, or and also in the uh, in the internet stock bubble years. Uh, he knew that um, you know these big companies, you know the Goldmans and the and the Morgan Stanleys, that they were essentially gigantic insider trading, front running operations, just like he would have been <laughs> in that situation. Uh, and it it's it's spelled out in in such an obvious way in the book that that the whole place is corrupt. 
um, that I think it would be that, that that's the part that I think that would be really shocking for most people. I mean, the story itself with that crazy plot twist is so unbelievable. It's it's incredible, and it'll be really entertaining for people. But that part of it is is to me the amazing part. Right. I mean, I you know I remember uh, it was sometime after uh, maybe it was in two thousand two. Uh, I had gone to uh, I was at a wedding and uh, like a. Someone I knew had married into a family with just a tremendous amount of wealth. And so, um, you know, being completely um, uh, sort of uh, without any sort of uh, financial savvy whatsoever, I had an apartment at that time from back from my uh, sitcom days. And I was like, you know, talking to people, I was saying, you know, if there's somebody goes into Macy's at that time, it was, you know, certainly uh, people were considering somebody goes into Macy's and blows themselves up. Uh, I mean, won't every uh, uh, apartment uh, in, in in New York be worthless? And like all these people said to me, "Ah, that's kidding! The federal government would never let all that uh, wealth disappear." And I was like, "I don't, I don't even right. understand what you're talking about." <laughs> and, <laughs> right, right, right. It was right. just an understanding uh, that uh, the that the the wealthy losing their wealth is completely backstopped by the government, whereas um, the poor. Um, being completely ravaged. Uh, I sat on a panel with uh, Chris Hedges last night. We were talking about his book where he goes into these sort of what he calls sacrifice zones, four of the most sort of destitute places in the country, one of them being Camden, New Jersey, Mm -hmm. uh, not far from where you are now. And it's just those places have just been completely obliterated. And uh, there's no, there's no one coming to their rescue, uh, of course. And, uh, so I, I don't know. I found the whole thing just sort of stunning. Is there, I mean, when you sit down with these, uh, wall street types, are they, what is their sense about that? The whole thing is rigged. I mean, we saw a story that came out, I think a couple of days after, uh, uh the octopus came out about front running that was happening with, um, with, uh, uh hedge funds getting sort of a wink and a nod from institutional analysts uh, as to whether or not they're going to revise their um, their analyst reports up or down. You know, it was all sort of like, hey, any surprises that we should be, you know, don't tell me anything, uh, you know, specific, but any surprises, cough once right. for up, cough twice for down. And right, right, exactly. H- hang up if it's good, don't you know, stand the line if it's bad, yeah. yeah. No, I-, I think most most people on Wall Street have no illusions about the the system I, I think on, on a macro level people think that there still are some real bets you can make you know should you uh, you know should you buy gold should you buy treasury should you do this or that but um, certainly you know stocks and equities and even even interest rate changes in the Fed every if you'll notice there's always like a flurry of activity just before. Uh, interest rate changes are announced, you know, because the word is getting out somehow, uh, and so people are trading against that. I've had people call me who work for um, little brokerages, and they say that, uh, you know, a big bank will call them uh, at the end of a trading day and say, we want to buy soybeans or wheat or corn or whatever, and so they'll place the order for the bank, and then two minutes later, a billion dollars will, uh, of that will, will you know, go on the market because that same bank just made a, executed a trade order for, you know, a pension fund in California or whatever it is. So they're, you know, they're front-running their own clients. So this stuff is rampant. I think everybody knows that it's completely dirty, uh, and it, 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 and the the regulators are so totally overmatched with this stuff. There just aren't enough of them, and the schemes are just too clever for them to catch. So it's it's uh, it's crazy. So is there stuff. a solution to this, or is it simply like you know this is just a linchpin of society at its at its heart? Uh, our financial system is uh, you know all just sort of a um, a an illusion. But if enough people just sort of play along with it, that's the way it functions. I mean, is that sort of it's sort of like the LIBOR yeah, scandal? I, guess. I mean, is is that yeah. do they all? Does, I mean, everybody just says, like, look, you know, this is the way that humans interact with each other. You know, when two people sit down at a table, they look across it. It's just basically two projections of reality that are meeting each other that don't necessarily have anything to do with the, the realities that are actually sitting there. Yeah, no, I, 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 and I think that's 
that's the argument that you get from a lot of these companies whenever they're accused of wrongdoing. You, you hear the term sophisticated investors a lot, which is it's, it's basically a code for the people that we deal with know that we're out to screw them, you know. Uh, so um, when we do screw them, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't be you know accused of any wrongdoing because everybody in this world has their eyes wide open, and we all know that we're all trying to stab each other in the back. And that's kind of the attitude on Wall Street now is that you know with Goldman, for example, when Goldman was privately trashing uh, its you know, derivative mortgage backed derivatives uh in two thousand nine that they were trying to unload on everybody. Uh and then they were turning around and, you know, writing sales booklets saying how great they were. Uh when they when they got caught for that, they were like, Hey, you know, what do you what do you expect? We're all grown ups here, <laughs> you know. Uh you know, what do you think we're trying to do here? Not make money and, and that's that's kind of the attitude. I think it's not going to stop until uh, this is not something you can regulate away. It just has to, you have to just change the attitudes of people so that it's just no longer honorable to do that. Uh, but that, I just don't see that happening. I mean, that's, I guess, got to come more culturally. Right. I mean. Right. Yeah. And, exactly. I mean, why why don't you mug an old lady? Uh, you just you just don't. I mean, it's not because it's against the law or you're going to get caught. It's you just don't do it. <laughs> and and that's what's got to happen with these people. They got to they got to reach that point. Interesting. And uh, lastly, you know, I know you commented on Friedman's piece uh, yesterday, which was sort of really a uh, a tour, tour de force. Of force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, for Friedman because that was. Um, and I don't know if you've listened to that, um, that podcast that, um, Glenn Greenwald seemed to have found it from a, uh, an interview that he did in, um, in March in uh, New Zealand. And it's really, it's, it's, uh, I, I would check it out. He's got a post at Salon. It really is, um, unbelievable because first off, you've got this New Zealand woman who sounds like she's in her seventies, uh, and she's or maybe 60s. I mean, she's just an older woman, very sort of like benign sounding, but she's dogging him. And Friedman is losing it. And uh, by, by the end, he has to say, like, I don't know what neoliberal economics is. It's not a word that I use. And she, and she says, why not? Everybody else does. Uh, and, <laughs> and he's actually at the point where he is trying to, she, she sort of like boxes him in over the course of a, of a 35 minute, 40 minute interview. And within the last like 10 minutes, she sort of closes in the walls. He feels it coming the whole time. So he's incredibly paranoid as to where she's leading him. Uh, and he's at one point saying like, well, I, look, I, if we have to raise the retirement age for Social Security from 62 to 62 and a half, I don't see the big deal in that. And so you realize, like, you know, here's this guy. He is lying, knowingly lying to this New Zealand, you know, radio host. I mean, there must be, you know, her listenership, how many thousands of people could there be, you know, that are listening to her? Right. And he is knowingly lying about what the retirement age is so that he can sort of get off the phone. And, and it, it's... <laughs> And then she asked about his wealth, and he gets all huffy. It was, it was really fantastic just to hear, because first off, I don't know anywhere in uh, American media where you would have Friedman on the phone for forty-five minutes, if having to be having to defend himself. And well, you and then aside from that. Anybody who ever could get him on the phone for 45 minutes would never challenge him because, right. well, uh, he won't come back, and then a whole raft of other people won't come back. This woman right. was just like, I'm never going to talk to Thomas Friedman again. Uh, so right. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, this is, I don't care. I'm in New Zealand, a eh, hole. And, uh, that that was it's it's a beautiful. You know what? I I've kind of come around on Thomas Friedman. Uh, I I used to think he was like the Prince of Darkness, and this was back in his whole Iraq cheerleading right. stuck on this days. Uh, but now I think I think he's kind of mellowed, and uh, to me, he's just funny. Uh, I, I I think he. Uh, he seems to be a guy who's just making an enormous amount of money being a 
you know, essentially a buffoon and kind of enjoying himself. And he's got that mustache and everything, and he's got that huge. It's just, it just seems like a really fun life. I mean, he, I, I, I bet, I, I would, I think he actually probably gets a kick out of writing these columns that he must know just make n- no sense at all, and yeah. and and collecting en- enormous amounts of money for doing it. Uh, that just seems like a fun life to me. I don't. I don't know. I mean, well, I, it's I, helped by the fact that, he's, that he that he's married to a billionaire heiress. Um, and right, that's true. Yeah. And so I, I think you know I think it's more about for him. I think he's just not nearly as bright as um, he is given credit for. Um, and I oh, think, obviously, yeah. And yeah. I think he's just a bumbling fool who, um, you know, for him. I, I get I get there's a lot more white knuckled sort of quality to Thomas Friedman that I have always picked up from this guy that he is sort of constantly riding this wave of being afraid of being exposed knowing on some level that if he loses his gig as a New York Times uh, op-ed columnist and sort of this chief opiner of the uh, establishment class that his wife may just go like hmm you know, uh, you're kind of chubby, and, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I totally agree with you, and I, and I and I think that that fear is what drove him to be the the meanie that he was back in the early Bush years. But yeah. now I think he's kind of reached this like late stage Nirvana where he realizes that he's already been exposed and nobody cares, and he still gets to get all the money and gets to, you know, and, and, and so he's happy. And Listen so to this total... interview because he is so defensive. Okay. With <laughs> oh, the, really? It, okay. it really yeah. is right, I'll, awesome. And I'll I will say this. I had uh, one of, the, one of the, the highlights of my, uh, like, personal punditry career was sitting, I, I did Dylan Radigan's show with him, and I didn't know, you know, I knew that day that he was going to be on, and I worked in the phrase uh, into a question to him, sitting across the table, suck on this. And <laughs> the uh, look on his face for the rest of the show as he was just sort of glaring at me, looking to see if I did that on purpose, was uh, one of uh, just the favorite moments I've had, I think, <laughs> perhaps in, my <laughs> in the past 10 years. Um, and and I think close. he's a pretty angry guy uh, down below because I think he's he's... He's. I think he's always afraid of being exposed. But um, uh, hmm. I've heard that he's just gone off on people, like just uh, like full on swearing tirade. And uh, uh, well, that's kind of funny too. I, I wouldn't mind being a person like that too. So I don't know. That's, that's, that, I, I just. I'm, I'm trying to appreciate him. I'm. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to not. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting older. I guess I'm. I'm not. Not as. You're losing your edge, buddy. I know, man. I know. I know. I'm becoming a. Bourgeois, but there you uh, go. All anyway. right. Well, and nevertheless, it's still a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely, Sam. <laughs> uh, thanks. Let's get to begin soon. Yes. All right, uh, Matt Taibbi, folks. Uh, RollingStone.com. Thank you so much.